here we go with the final lab um, prior to your second practical. So this is going to be our last survey of kingdoms and we're going to be talking all about the kingdom Animalia for you guys today. Um, again, you have one of those sheets that you need to fill out, but we go straight into the tables and at this point you guys should know how those tables work out, so we're just going to kind of jump right in. Everything today is in the kingdom Animalia. All animals are made out of eukaryotic cells. We are all heterotrophic, so we have to be able to eat something. We are all multicellular. Um, most animals can move around as adult forms, but if they don't move as adults, they could at least move as larval forms, and so we move around at some point in our life, and that's what motile means right there. First off, phylum periphera. This is the sponges. They're called that because they look like they have a bunch of pores. They actually do have a bunch of pores in them. Um, these are called chimney sponges in a lot of cases. These guys are filter feeders. I think I have a little video to show you that explains kind of how they filter feed. Both brooding and broadcasting reproductive strategies are found in sponges. Synchronicity and timing release of gametes has been shown in several Caribbean sponges. However, regulatory aspects of reproduction in sponges are poorly known. The following footage shows a broadcasting spawning event of the sponge genus Zestospongia. Lunar phase and warmer water temperatures are correlated with the spawning event of these species. So spawning is how they do reproduction. It is a form of sexual reproduction. They kind of throw out their sperm and eggs and hope they run into each other. So that one wasn't about feeding. It was actually about how do they reproduce. Next up, phylum Cnidaria. This is your uh, jellies or jellyfish. They aren't actually fish, so I just like to call them jellies. But um, phylum Cnidaria, the sea is silent. What's unique about them is they all have tentacles, and their tentacles have these special little cells that are called um, nidocytes. The nidocytes contain nematocysts, and then the nematocysts are these little harpoon-like things that can produce a toxin. Um, sometimes it's a neurotoxin, so it damages the nervous system and paralyzes fish. Sometimes it's just a cytotoxin that damages cells. There's different stuff. Um, I'll just choose this video for us to watch. Jellyfish can be really calming if you're having one of those anxiety-filled days, because there's just so... I don't know, calming and smooth as they swim. A liberty butchin. Hi. That cloud you see is, in fact, a colossal swarm of thimble jellyfish, each no bigger than your thumbnail. These jellyfish are 95% water. They are, in a sense, separate from and a part of the sea at the same time. They've survived for 650 million years, and yet they have no brain, no heart, no blood, no gills, and no complex nervous system. Somehow, they can taste, smell, and balance themselves, a fairly complex task. So that's some jellyfish swimming around. Again, kind of relaxing when you just kind of watch them. Next up, we have the platyhelminths. Uh, that word, helminth, means worm. Platy means flat, so these are your flatworms. It really does look like you take these worms and you press them between the pages of a book because they are flat. This is our first group that has what's known as bilateral symmetry where they have a definite head end and then they've got a butt or a tail end. Um, so these are tapeworms. You don't often find those in human beings unless the human being has not been cooking their food appropriately. But if you've ever adopted a dog from a shelter, chances are they probably had some tapeworms that are living in them and they give off these like little, they look kind of like grains of rice. Each one of those grains of rice is one of these segments of a tapeworm, and each one of those segments is called a proglottid. The proglottids are little baby-making factories, and so there's little baby tapeworms inside of those things, and if a dog were to eat one of those little rice kernels, they are reinvesting themselves with tapeworms. And so tapeworms can be difficult to get rid of. They can steal the nutrients from your pets, and so if you think your dog might have tapeworms, it's important to take them to the vet and then get them dewormed. Um, there's different kinds of platyhelminths, so um, this is a liver fluke. It is a parasite that lives in the liver versus tapeworms lived in the digestive system. Um, if you're a hunter and you get yourself a deer or a hog, it's important to check the liver to see whether or not they have these flukes living in them, because if you ingest these, you can get infested with the liver fluke. Next up, we have round worms, and guess what? They are worms that are round. Uh, this is Ascaris. It is a human parasite. This one can get into the digestive system. Dogs can also get nematodes, and if they get them, they need to be dewormed. Um, there are little ones. There are big ones. Ascaris happens to be one of the bigger ones. The female can end up being about a foot long, so you would definitely notice if you pooped one of those guys out. 
Uh, trichinella, this is spelled wrong. There should be an I right in between the H and the N right here. Trichinella spiralis is another parasite, but this one goes to the muscle, not to the digestive system. So this is a biopsy of somebody's muscle who had trichinella. The worm insists in the muscle and it makes it incredibly painful to move that muscle. You get this one from eating undercooked, usually pork. Um, and so the warning here is to make sure you always cook your pork to the appropriate temperature to make sure you kill any worms that might be in there. If you're getting pork at a grocery store, this should not be a problem. But if you're, again, a hunter and you're killing and eating feral hogs, you could get trichinella from those hogs. Pinworms are microscopic little nematodes. This one is unique because, again, it does live in the digestive system, kind of like tapeworms, but they don't reproduce the same way. In fact, it's really creepy how they play their game. So when a female ends up with, she's gravid, she has a bunch of eggs, she will crawl out of the person's butthole, the anus, and then she will glue her eggs around the butthole. And when the person wakes up the next day, their butt is itchy because there's all these eggs glued to it. So as they scratch their butt, they get the eggs underneath their fingernails. And then if they put those fingers back in their mouth or nose, they reinfest themselves with those pinworms. Pinworms are a very common thing that you find in uh, daycares and in schools, elementary school, like kindergarten and first grade, because kids don't have very good hygiene. So if your kid's ever walking around and they're scratching their butt a lot, this might be what you think about and take them to the doctor. Next up. Annelids are going to be segmented worms. I'll show you what those look like here on the next slide, but it does look like their body has these little repeating segments, and that's because they do. The classic example of an annelid is an earthworm. This is our first group of animals that we're going to go down to class in your table. So still in the earthworm, they were in the phylum annelida. Now they are in the class oligochaeta. Oligochaeta means few bristles, and that's if, I don't know if you guys have ever like played with an earthworm a lot, but if you run your fingers from the butt end to the head end, and you can tell the head end because there's that little swollen spot that's called the clitellum in most earthworms, um, if you run your fingers up them, you're going to feel all these little bristles on the side, and they're little bitty, and there aren't that many of them, but you can feel them. Those are the bristles that they're talking about up here. Polychaeta means lots of bristles. And so the bristles here have gotten bigger. You don't even have to like run your fingers. You can see them. They look kind of like legs, but they're not. They don't help the animal move. Instead, they help with gas exchange. Um, unless you've been scuba diving in the ocean, you probably haven't ever noticed a polychaete. So I kind of wanted to show you what one of these guys looks like. <laughs> Mm. Next up, um, leeches, still in an annelid, they are still segmented worms, and you can see the little segments of the body repeating themselves. So they don't have any bristles, but they will very often have suckers at one end or both ends. Those suckers help them stay attached to whatever they feed on. Not all leeches are blood suckers, but the ones that you're familiar with probably are. Um, leeches are in the class Hyrodinia because they make an anticoagulant called hyrodin. Now an anticoagulant is a blood thinner. It prevents your blood from clotting. That's an advantage for them because they are blood feeders. If you clot, you stop feeding them. So they secrete the blood thinner so that you don't stop bleeding and you continue to feed them. We won't watch this whole thing. I kind of want to skip to where they find the leech. You just invited me into this pond. We're no more than three feet in from the shore, and I am knee deep in muck. Yes, you are. I can I can barely pull my foot out. This is what we. Uh, this is what we call a wetland. What used to be called a swamp. Normally, it takes them a little while to realize we're here. They they respond to movement in the water first, mm -hmm. and they'll come swimming from many meters away. They can feel the movement, especially in an open spot like this. In fact, there, there's one coming right now. Do you see him? I got him. I got him. Yeah, there. there we go. Oh, that's a doozy. Is he big because he's fed, or big because he's just bigger and older? This one's probably big because he's older, and uh, probably it's second summer here in this pond. And it's trying to find a place to feed on you. And what's it looking for? It's already on you. It's, it's looking for a place that it can taste the right substance, like salts or amino acids or whatever comes out of our, our, out of our skin. The palms of my hands are fairly rough, and, and the leaves is not going to be able to get the right taste. Too, too much, 
<laughs> between your fingers is a, a fairly good spot. Or between any two other parts of your body. In your toes, ankles are pretty good, the backs of knees. Uh. So there's your little blurb on leeches. Next up, Gornithophyllum mollusca. This is a pretty big phylum. There's a bunch of different kinds of organisms that are in here. Some of them have a shell, but not all of them do. They have a muscular foot. That muscular foot can be modified into different things depending on which class we're going to be looking at. Our first class is going to be our snails and slugs. These are in the class Gastropoda. That word literally means stomach foot, and that's because their stomach is in their foot. So both um, of these guys are in here. And again, not all of your mollusks are going to have shells, like slugs don't have shells. Let's see, I think this is going to be a snail eating. So snails are fairly destructive to gardens. So if you're a gardener, you're probably going to be battling both slugs and snails, because if they get into your tomatoes, they will eat all your tomatoes before you ever have a chance to do that. Now this video is not in real time, it's been sped up, but it shows you exactly what they can do to your garden. I don't really need their music going on in the background. So they have fed this snail some lettuce and you can see it chomping on it. And again, imagine that in your garden, it's not going to make you super duper happy in there because they do tend to like to eat not just leafy greens, again, they'll go for your fruits and vegetables as well. I've grown a lot of tomatoes. I have eaten very few of them because the snails almost always get to them before I do. So they are annoying little garden pests, but kind of cute when you see them. Next up, cephalopods. These are kind of my favorite out of all the animals. So cephalopod means head foot. Um, their foot has been modified into these tentacles and then they have a head going on. So they have a head, they have some feet. Uh, this is the most intelligent class that is not a vertebrate. They have a large brain. They have amazing eyes that are actually better than our eyes because of the arrangement of the axons over the retina. Um, they're capable of problem solving. They can change their colors to communicate or to camouflage themselves. They can solve problems. They can teach others. I'll click this video. Let's see what this one is. Hmm. Search lights. Rogers collected many brilliant examples of camouflage. Not just changing colors, but also the very shape of their skin. And here you'll see the dynamics that we go from smooth skin to this great big mountain in the skin of papillae to create that three-dimensional texture. No. Just take a look at this. That shows you pretty well how good they are at camouflage, and they don't, it's just amazing what they're able to do, essentially. Um, Polyplacophorans you won't see around our area, but if you go to rocky intertidal beaches, you might be able to find them. They're sort of like a cross between a roly poly and a slug. Um, the roly-poly because they have this, these multiple plates that go along to their shell and they can roll up if they need to roll up, but slug because they still have that muscular foot that all of our mollusks are supposed to have. Since most of my Texans are not familiar with chitons, I've got a little video just to show you one of these guys on a rock. Um, if you ever do go to a rocky beach and your kid's annoying you and you want to give them something to do for a while, tell them if they can pull one of these off the rock, they can keep it. And that's because they create this amazing suction cup, and it's nearly impossible even for a full-size uh, adult to pull them off of the rocks once they're attached. So that'll keep your kid busy for just a while. Next up, bivalves. They're called that because they have two shells. Um, this would be your clams, your scallops, your oysters, your mussels, the things that can make pearls off down here too. Um, let's see, kind of they, so they are gill breathers. They also use their gills to help them feed. I don't think I have any good videos that go along with them, but probably you've picked up shells from them along a beach because they can be in the freshwater as well. In fact, zebra mussels are a major lake invasive species in Texas right now. Next, we get to the largest phylum in terms of number of organisms and diversity for that matter, the phylum Arthropoda. Arthropoda means jointed foot or jointed leg, and that's because everything in this group does have jointed legs. They also have an exoskeleton, unlike you. So while you do have jointed legs, you don't have an exoskeleton, you have an endoskeleton, so this isn't your group. The organisms we're going to talk about, we're going to start with our centipedes. They are in the class Chylopoda. They get one pair of legs per segment instead of the millipedes here in just a second. They're going to get two pairs of legs per segment. 
Um, some of the centipedes in our area are venomous. It's kind of analogous to a bee bite is what I've been told. I haven't ever been bitten by a centipede though, so I can't really tell you what it feels like. Um, crustaceans, this is gonna be your lobsters, your crab, your shrimp. Around here, we've got crawdads there in this group too. This is what they look like before you cook them. And because this is Texas near Louisiana, we do crawdad boils or crayfish boils, whichever way you wanna say that. Um, let's see what this video is. I think it's spider crabs, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So spider crabs are these really large crabs. I don't know why. I don't really want this to play, but if it's not going to move, I'll play it. Ugh. i got to find more videos that don't have ads in front of them. All right. So these spider crabs are crustaceans. Um, they're coming together here for a molting, and when they're molting, they're very susceptible to predators, and so they tend to aggregate together while they molt, because if you're in a pile of a million spider crabs, the chance that you get eaten in that group is much smaller. So it's winter time. Do keep that in mind. But these are just, imagine scuba diving around and then encountering just meters and meters and meters of spider crabs on the ground and that's what happens during their winter molt as they come together. Next up, Insecta. So this is the biggest group in the phylum Arthropoda. Everything in this group does have six legs. They may or may not have wings. It depends on where they are in their metamorphosis. So this is just a dragonfly, but pretty much any bug that you're familiar with, not spiders, but any bug like a fly or a cockroach, they are going to be in this group. Arachnids, this is where the spiders are going to go. This is also where ticks and mites go. And mites can be like dust mites, so that it, they can be really, really teeny tiny or they can get bigger. Um, I don't have a little thing for them, a video, so we'll just move on. Phylum Echinodermata, that word means spiny skin, and they do all have spiny skin. Um, sometimes called starfish, I tend to call them sea stars because, again, they're not fish. Uh, sand dollars are in this group. Most people haven't seen a live sand dollar. You just get the skeleton of them on the beach if you go to the beach or you can buy them at craft stores. And these guys have this unique water vascular system. Eh, this isn't really the video I want to show you. Let's try this one. What these guys do, the starfish especially, or the sea stars, is they eat clams. They use their water vascular system. Specifically, they have these little tube feet that are part of that and they are suction cups they create suction cups and then they will just sit there and they will pry the clam apart and they pull for so long and so strongly that eventually the clam tires out then the sea star ever like it throws its stomach up into the clam shell digests the clam inside of its shell and then once the nutrients are small enough it will bring those nutrients back in there so they tried to feed this sea star a clam and they're calling it aggressive, but they're trying to steal its food from it. So it's not really aggressive. They, they should let it eat its clam and go on about its life. Hmm. Next up, everything else for the remainder of this chapter is going to be in the phylum chordata. This group has four unique features. So they have a notochord. That's what's going to become our spinal column, the vertebrae. We have a dorsal hollow nerve tube. That's what's going to become our brain and our spinal cord. Everything before this, if they've had a good nerve tube, it's been ventral and not dorsal, and it's been solid and not hollow. Um, we have pharyngeal gills at some point in our life, and then we have a postanal tail, which is unique because all the other groups, their anus was at the end of their tail. Now we have additional body after that. First group that we have is going to be the lamprey eel. Um, this is what they look like. They, they are often parasites of other fish, but they don't have to be. This shows you the mouth of a lamprey eel. They cannot open or close their mouth. It is always in this state. That's why they're called jawless fish. Got a little video to show you of a parasitic lamprey eel. And of course there's more stupid commercials. So this big fish that they've caught is a paddlefish. They're on the Mississippi River. That is the lamprey, and it's, it's kind of analogous to the leech. It does the same thing. It sort of macerates the tissue, and then it eats the tissue of the paddlefish as it's predating or preying on that item. Um, parasitizing, that organism would be a better word to use for that. And so if you've ever caught a fish that has one of these attached to it, it's another fish. It's just um, a less evolved fish that doesn't have a true vertebral column that's made out of bone. They're made out of cartilage instead. Next up, we have class chondrichthys, that word. So ichthys means fish, like an ichthyologist is a person who studies fish. 
Chondro means cartilage, so this word means cartilaginous fish. These guys do have a cartilage skeleton. Now the jaw of sharks does get to be very bony, and that's because they, ex they exert a lot of force on their jaws, and so they need it to be a little bit stronger. But the rest of their skeleton is just made out of cartilage. These guys have a lateral line that helps them sense wave movements and sense when something is splashing around maybe so that they can detect where prey items may end up being. Um, Osteichthys is bony fish. This is our first group that does have a nice little bony skeleton, which if you've ever caught fish for yourself, probably you have accidentally eaten a bone that goes along with that fish. For this one, I have a silly video for you, but it makes me happy, so we're going to watch it. Mm. That's about the The female anglerfish comes in many shapes, colors, and shades of ugly. It's like a rainbow of ugly. The male anglerfish is tiny by comparison, like a tiny little baby. He attaches himself to the female by biting her and then digesting part of his face so he fuses with her flesh. He then atrophies, losing his digestive organs, brain, heart, and eyes, and winds up nothing more than a pair of gonads which release sperm when needed. Hey there, pretty lady. Nice gonads. To the female anglerfish, the human male is a very loud, annoying, and unnecessarily complicated pair of gonads. The anglerfish is a master of disguise, hiding itself among the sand and rocks of the ocean floor. Here, an anglerfish compares its camouflaging skills with that of a flounder, also a master. Holy crap! Did you... What the fuck? To hunt, the anglerfish waves things in front of its mouth that its prey is attracted to. Here, the anglerfish waves a lovely pashmina shawl, just the size for an unsuspecting shrimp. Here, another one presents a lovely pair of leggings. And here, a decorative hat feather. Sadly, the shrimps and their vanity pay the ultimate price. Death. The deep sea anglerfish collects glowy, glowy bacteria in its wavy thing to create a tiny little light. Because it's dark as hell down there, and someone needs to light up that pretty, pretty lady. So anglerfish are bony fish, so they are in the class Osteichthys. So are most of the fish that you're familiar with, like goldfish or perch or trout or bass or catfish or whatever. Next up, class amphibia. So amphibia means essentially two lives. They have a life that they spend in water when they're tadpoles and they reproduce in that water, but then most of them get out of the water and then they can live on land, so they undergo a complete metamorphosis. Um, salamanders actually don't finish their metamorphosis, so they keep their tail like they had when they were tadpoles, so these are both salamander species. Again, as a general rule, if something is brightly colored, it tends to mean it makes a toxin, so don't touch it. Mm. So this little guy is adorable. He is real, and this is him trying to scare you. Yeah, that's real, and I know you're terrified at home, but it's okay. Come back to me. We're going to continue on. Next up, class Reptilia. So this is the snakes and lizards and turtles, tortoises, crocodiles, gators, things along those lines. Um, generally speaking, if you see a snake and it has a triangular shaped head like this, it, especially in Texas, it tends to mean that they're venomous, so leave them alone. Um, of course, if it has a rattle, that means it's a rattlesnake, definitely leave it alone. But class reptilia is our first group that has what's known as an amniotic egg, so they can reproduce on land completely. Everything else before here had to be tied to water. Uh, this happens to be a very venomous snake, although they're pretty chill as long as you don't bother them. So this is a sea crate or a sea snake. And then, in the background, we got this shark coming up because he's wiggling around. So that is a class chondrichthian shark. Notice, even though that snake could come back here and bite this, it's like, ah, whatever, I'll just leave. Most snakes are like that. They won't mess with you unless you mess with them. Next, class AV. So modern phylogeny actually puts birds into the class reptilia, but this is an older version. And quite frankly, I think birds are different enough that they should be in their own separate class. But so no, the taxonomy on this one is sort of hit and miss. Uh, class AV separates them out from the reptiles. So this is everything that is endothermic. This is our first warm blooded group. They have feathers. Most of them can fly, but there are flightless birds like penguins and ostriches and things. Let's see what this one is. Maybe it's the Mockingbird. Yeah. 
So it is currently mockingbird breeding season and mockingbirds get very hostile when you get next to their nest. So they're going to show you this video slowed down numerous times. I kind of want you to see how a mockingbird attacks things. You would think it uses its beak and like pecks at you, but you'll notice it doesn't after they replay this slower. In this video, the squirrel has upset the mockingbird. And so the mockingbird is trying to chase the squirrel away from its nest. They'll slow it down one more time so you can see it a little bit better. I kind of wonder if the dude even saw it. Notice the bird is literally kicking the squirrel in the butt. That's how they attack. The birds will do that to cats. They'll do it to dogs. They'll do it to kids that get cl too close to their nest. They usually don't mess with adult humans too much, but they can if you really are antagonizing them. Um, so that's mockingbirds, which are the state bird of Texas, incidentally, and they are some of the cockiest birds when they're doing their mating season. Last class, class mammalia. This is the class that we are in. We are endothermic, so again, warm-blooded. We have hair to help us maintain our temperature, or our, our, ours isn't super effective for that anymore. And we feed our young with mammary glands. Um, they're giving you a cow, but you guys know mammals, cats, dogs. Um, this video, I think, is going to be a wild hamster, because yes, hamsters do live in the wild. These guys are, I think they're speaking Russian. I really have no idea what language they're, they're speaking in this, so I'm just going to turn it off. They're translating it for you. Um, they were trying, supposedly, to help this hamster get across the street, and this hamster does not want their help. So now you know if you ever run across a wild hamster in Russia, don't try to help it across the street. Leave it alone. Again, I love how cocky he is. You could just kick him and you would be okay, and yet he is still going to try to murder you. They start laughing at him here, and that pisses him off. Watch how he re he's like, are you laughing at me? It's the best thing ever. He is going to murder that shoe so hard. So there you go. There's another mammal that you guys can have. So that completes your taxonomy. Make sure you take the quiz over taxonomy three, the animals. That quiz is going to be timed just like all the other lab quizzes. Um, after this one, the only thing left for lab is your lab practical, which is also going to be timed in online.